to a Cisco meeting. You are entering the meeting now. Again? Again? Yeah. Alright, let's hand up. Oh, you can't pan that camera, you can only pan ours. No, I mean, hand up, right? So this should be disconnected? Oh, hang up, yeah. Point up there. There it goes. Alright, then I need to <laughs> write down the number so that we can get it right. And you can go down so to reach the Okay. Press the yeah. I did it once. Let's go up. Okay. Now press it again. So this is the right one, right? Yeah. Press call again. I just press the enter button right there. Okay. Welcome to a Cisco meeting. You are entering the meeting now. Huh. Same room. Yeah. Well, I think they've got it. I think they've got this room for the class before this and aren't disconnecting. So go ahead and hang up. I just talked to Stanley upstairs. Go ahead and hang up. Okay. And, uh, if I get it resolved during the class period, I'll come down here and okay. take care of it. But yeah. Sounds good. <coughs> if nothing else, you're going to upload that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, if you are curious why I raised it up, because I'm a little bit old fashioned guy, so I like to use the chop and board. And later, if, if needed, I'll, we, I'll go back and forth using projection and that, okay? Um, so, let's get started while they're fixing the other party. <coughs> Everybody get ready for the first class? Technically, this first one. So, um, anyone has a problem access to the canvas? Everybody gets it. Can you see the the actually the slides is uploaded there? Okay, everybody got it. Okay, and additionally, I have uploaded um, a one of the short handout talks about vector concepts. Everybody had a chance to see it. Okay, great. You guys are stay on the top than me. So, mm -hmm. vectors we we gonna talk a little bit about today. And third is not not particularly something that uh, if you're interested you can look into. That's a lecture from last year. So, no, we actually gonna make some adjustment to make sure um, we are catered to you know this class. Um, great. So let's get started. So what are we gonna do in this class? So this, in the first class, for the particularly with this month, I'm going to give an introduction about what we're going to talk about in this um, chapter. So as everybody knows, this is going to be covers, chapter 6. Apparently there is a book open right there. And chapter 6 is about chain confirmation and chain statistics. Okay? So I'll give you everybody an overview of what we're going to talk about in this particular class. So. Um, give you guys an understanding of what you need to understand at the end of this month to successfully pass the exam for this particular class. So, in terms of chain confirmation, so what do you need to learn about this particular class? Anybody really take a head start and tell me what we need to learn about chain confirmation. Anyone? Any volunteer? The chain. That's a major part of it, is understand the size and dimension of the polymer, right? So let's give a call the size and dimension. OK? So that's a major part. So that includes end-to-end -end distance. Okay, 
So that's a very key part. And we will, to understand that, we're actually going to talk about several different chain models. There's a total of three chain models we're going to discuss. So everybody should uh, get ready for what are the chain models we're going to talk about, and what's the pros and cons, what's unique about this chain model, and what's the limitation about with this particular model. OK? So after that, we talk about size, dimension, chain model. Then we're going to talk into several different class of the polymer. You're going to have rigid polymer and also flexible. So we need to understand what is OK, so these are several concepts we need to master for this class. And there's one more. And there's radius of gyration, or RG, is another method we measure the chain conformation for this particular class. OK? So it's total about seven chapter. So we got about roughly eight class, which is, should be a good match. So I will try to stick with the textbook and give you guys a, an, a clear route where we are going, OK? Total of eight class. So now I'm going to start discussing about the first class. So first class is basically an introduction about this particular chapter. I want to start with. Um, what is everybody's expectation in terms of saying study polymer physics? When we talk about polymer physics, what actually came into your mind the first reaction? Properties. Properties. Uh, about, about, can you be a little bit specific about what property we study in terms of polymer physics? Electrical property conformation. I think they will be related, but not exactly what we're going to discuss in this particular class. But it's good that you, you touch base about that physical property. Um, it's, it, it's the, the property you talk about is more generally in terms of materials property. So how does a material possess a certain property? Right? It can be optical, it can be physical, or electrical or mechanical. Anything else come into your mind in terms of polymer physics? Sony? Um, Is, can you say that again? I'm sorry, I missed sterics it. Sterics. Ster yeah, sterics or stereohindric property, right? So that actually is tied into this chain confirmation chapter. And we will discuss about that. Not only in terms of size, but we were talked about conformation. OK? Any more answer in terms of polymer physics comes into your, your mind? Spatial arrangement. Spatial arrangement. How you arrange yourself in three dimensionally. That will be discussed in very much detail in this class as well. Spatial arrangement. Interaction between the chains, that's a very good point. Physical polymer physics deals a lot with how different chains interact with the, each other. And um, I actually will not discuss this in, in my chapter. So in, let me allude you to what are you going to learn in the next uh, two classes. So polymer physics, too, is talking about everything about solution scattering and dynamics. Dynamics talks about how you relax and changes over time. In our class, we currently study statistics, or more or less statistics, what the chain looks like three-dimensionally. OK? So and one more class is uh, Dr. Sergei Nazaringo's class. He actually will teach you about all the morphology of polymer, how the chain crystallizes, what is gloss transition temperature. That's all his topic. So I won't steal his thunder. So in my class, 
if you look at me in this particular class, we only gonna study how I look like, how many arms I have, how tall I am. So literally you are looking at the size and the physical property. And if there's a way you can describe me, and what is that parameter? And how do you describe someone like me? And apparently, if you tell somebody about my height and weight, you probably already guessed how big I am. If you think about a football player, you associate with six to seven feet tall, maybe 300 pounds, right? That's like size and dimension about a polymer as well. So we're gonna study what kind of size and physical property of our material and how can we describe it? So in the first chapter, I will touch base with what we discussed in the last lecture about two things, what the size and what is conformation specific ties into polymer, okay? Size and conformation. And it's just gonna be a short introduction. And this mostly gonna be tied into chapter 6.1 in your textbook. If you have already read it, you will easily follow what I'm gonna talk about. So, in other words, I also want to tie into the slides. We actually, we have slides one to four is what we're gonna cover today. So, that's what we're gonna talk about today, okay? So when you talk about polymer, before I actually start discussing anything, I want to, to give you some of the background in terms of what a molecular weight is. And molecular weight, is, you guys should start, um, if you already learned polymer uh, courses, you should already know what is molecular weight is defined as, right? I bet most of you should already know. Molecular weight is, is actually an interesting thing if you think historically, you know, back about a hundred years ago, nobody believed that what is a polymer. If you talk about polymer, people think you're crazy. There is nothing exist in terms of polymer. It's just a, you know, molecular that is large and very large, or there are some non-covalent force associated with it. Actually, uh, there's a good story. Back into 1920, that's when uh, the polymer field uh, is sort of taking shape is when uh, Storlinger from Germany established the concept of macromolecular, okay? He fight it really hard because nobody wants to believe there is existence of polymer. Everybody saw it's just another molecule. And polymer really it doesn't ex establish until this person convey the idea. And in the polymer, one of the key concepts is how long your polymer chain is and how big it is, right? So a key of the describe is molecular weight. Okay, so everybody should already know what is the definition of molecular weight. How long a polymer chain and how heavy it is. So molecular weight, there are several definitions, and I won't, again, overlap too much with the chemistry class. I believe they're going to talk about in more detail in terms of what is number average molecular weight, weight average molecular weight, okay? And they're very different, so I hope you guys should learn that. Why we need to talk about molecular weight? Because we're gonna start discuss about molecular weight and help us, again, recapture what we discussed in the last class in terms of what's the physical dimension of our polymer. Okay? I won't, you know, repeat myself too much. What we talk about is if you have a 120 kilodalton polyethylene, you would expect a contour lens. So this is the first we're going to discuss the concept about contour lens. And it, is anyone remember how we get three microns, roughly? Anyone? Bond we, length of one carbon-carbon bond is 1.5, and there are two per polyethylene. 
perfect. And we know the molecular wave, so we know how many repeating bonds are there. Okay? So here we're going to define the first concept about what is contour lens. So this we're going to repeatedly encounter in our classes contour lens, which means in ideal chain, if there's no bond angle, if you pull the chain fully straight, I want to use the term again, uncooked pasta. So it's just a stick and as long as possible. That's the lens of your polymer chain. That's what we call it a contour lens. Okay, so contour lens is the longest form you can adopt in terms of polymer. And that's usually in the ideal case. Okay, in this particular case, we specifically mean the bond can rotate any given angle. There is no limitation you're given that. I cannot do that because my ankle has a certain limitation. I cannot bend my ankle this way because I'm going to broke my arm, right? I can only bend in one direction. So in an ideal polymer chain, it can do whatever it like. So when, you, when your chain can do all kinds of configuration, the longest the configuration is when your chains can pull it strictly. OK? How about we give a little bit of constraint? When you consider now every carbon-hydrogen bond, you know, uh, carbon takes four bonds of hydrogen. You know, if you think of methane, it's an example of what carbon-hydrogen bond will be look like. So you can actually sort of understand how big that is, right? So there's a certain angle build into your polymer chain. So again, let's draw, kind of try to draw it in three dimensionally. How does it look like? So this would be a typical carbon bond. It's basically a tetragonal shape. So you can probably guess what this angle is if you started before. How big is that? That sounds about right. Because I cannot remember that. I know it's about somewhere between 100 and 110. This angle is roughly fixed if you have a given polymer chain, right? We have a, it can fluctuate a little bit, but not much. So when you talk about a real chain, there's usually constraint attached to it. So if you think about polyethylene, if you have to fix the carbon-hydrogen bond angle, then even you're trying to pull it like a pasta, you cannot make it fully straight. There's always bond angle limitation you cannot overcome, right? Everybody gets that? So in the real chain case, your fully extended chain will be slightly different. So if we need to put a number in it, we can go back to the slides, which I already described, what would be the bond angle would be. So you think about now, you have different angles built into it. So this would be the bond angle, OK? This would be 109.5 degree, right? So if you think about this is carbon, we ignore the, all the hydrogen along the backbone of the polyethylene, OK? Right? So if you do the calculation, OK? Is it Sorry. Lena? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Typically, it will be related uh, to particular molecular model, okay. okay? So if you talk about ideal chain model, where there's no limitation in the bond angle, then you're going to be strictly longest. If you talk about, um, I would talk a specific later, but for free joint chain model, which is the ideal case, you would have longest extension. For rotation, um, hinder rotation model, which I will talk a little bit more detail. Okay, 
will have the limitation to the bond and you will have certain angles you can adopt. All right? So, if you do calculation, what the difference is now, you're going to have an angle come into play. So if we try to understand how the polyethylene in a slightly more realistic pace, not a fully stretched, you're going to have a slightly different angle. That's making the chain slightly shorter, right? Because there's a kink every segment. And you can actually calculate out what is this particular angle need to be, right? Everybody get the mass, how to do the fully, uh, the, the length of the chain along this direction? How can we solve this problem? It requires a little bit mass in the, right? It's a triangle, so you can, this lens along the backbone is pretty much in line with the distance here, right? So now you have a simplify for each bone repeating segment, you have a, a triangle. If this angle is now, which we have a students already helped me understand it's 109 degree. How long, let's call it LX, LY, LZ. So how does, do we know how, how long is LY in this direction? 1.5. Then how long this will be, Lx? Because angle is no, right? Angle is theta. Wouldn't be Ly sine theta. It's going to be equals to Ly multiplied by sine half of theta, right? Because mm -hmm. sine theta, by definition, half theta by definition is the lens of Lx divided by Ly. So in this regards, you can actually get how long your lens would be along the polymer backbone. If there's a bone angle built into that and you cannot change it, right? So you would have a contour lens basically very similar This is a carbon carbon bond, which is 1.5 uh, angstrom. This is a repeating unit, right? We did it in last class for 28K. This is a 10,000, right? Everybody get it? And a 1.5. If we don't consider this angle, this would be three, uh, three uh, microns, to be exact. But once we consider the angle, it will be slightly lower, but pretty much on the same order, OK? 2.5 microns, if you consider angle. There's a little bit of contraction. Give us some ideas how big the, how, how long the, these molecules will be in terms of lens-wise, right? So the second thing we actually talk a little bit is about in the, in the very much dense phase. So how compact you would have your chains would it be? And anybody can help me understand? This is more or less the longest ext extension you could have for a given polymer chain. I'm going to turn, turn on the light so I can see it better. So what, in this case, is what we talk about the longest as possible, OK? So for a given chain, I, I pull it in this dimension. And pretty much we are talking about nanoscale. So when we zoom you know, a million times into a given polymer in real world phase, that's what you see in a given chain. How do you understand in terms of how compact they would they would get. We understand how big they would extend, 
that's actually um, something you would need to describe a polymer in a fully extended case. Sort of when my arm is fully extended, when I try to squeeze myself as tight as possible, we kind of touched the base a little bit, but didn't go into much detail in the last class. Okay. Any thoughts? I need some help. Lena. Yes. And you can use the density of your polymer and the molecular weight. Yes. In order to calculate the drop point. Perfect. That's a uh, that's a very smart way. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is where you would uh, try to solve the problem if you're trying to understand how mostly dense possible way you could compact a polymer chain. Because we know roughly what's the density of a polymer coil is, right? And you also know what's the molecular weight, right? So molecular weight, this is basically, you can also written as molecular weight as grams per mole, right? That's also another way you describe the molecular weight. So how heavy is the single chain? Wow. Any any answer? How heavy is a single polyacetylene chain and this molecular weight? Can you speak up a little bit? Help me please. Yes. So everybody understand what the, what the concept of mole, right? So one mole means how many uh, individual uh, polymer chains there. One mole equals to roughly 6, 10 to the power of 23, right? This is uh, called Avogadro constant. So that means how many individuals are. Is that a mole case? Yes. Yes. So in this particular case, it will be chain. Okay. How many chains? So this this is enormous big number. Ten to the twenty three is crazy high. Right? So if you want to measure the weight of a single chain, I don't think human being has the techniques maybe to my knowledge to do that, because the best balance they can measure nanograms or even smaller, but not on the level of this, because how heavy is your, your, your single chain? It's going to be using this number divided by this, right? So that gives you roughly 10 to the minus 18, which is uh, if you think about nanogram divided by another 10, you know, um, uh, 10 billion, that's crazy small. So we have a way to understand how, what's the volume of polymer chain in dense form. This would be the lowest possible way you can make your polymer chain. Most of the dense pool. You know the weight? So molecular weight M will be equals to molecular weight, which is time uh, 280 grams per mole divided by 6, 10 to the 23. I'm going to I'm not going to do the math here cuz and my math is not that good. Okay? But when you go back use a calculator, it's a great invention everybody should use it. So you don't need to g go through this pain. How do we get the other way in terms of density and volume to get the same mass? Do we know the density in macroscopic form for polyethylene? Right? So it's about 0 0.9 Grand, 
let's let's wrote density equals to 0 0.9 multiplied by so this should be gram per centimeter square that's your density of polyethylene everybody knows it now mass divided by density you will get the volume Well, we don't need to go through that much detail because somebody did it for me. So the volume would be, let me get it right. Four point five times minus nineteen. And we assume it's a spherical structure then you can get the radius of sphere, right? So you got the volume. Now you can convert volume to the radius of your chain. Yeah? And volume for a sphere would be, and r is radius, 3 fourths pi r cubed um, three times, OK? So, in other words, R is about 5 nanometer. And we kind of touched base in the last class. But now you know why R is about 3 nanometer. Uh, 5 nanometer, not 3. Type. 5 nanometer, OK? So, let me give you some ideas how much compact the chain can get. Fully extended. To fully compact 500 times, I cannot squeeze myself 500 times. I'm going to kill myself. But let's give you some ideas how polymer chains could adopt the different forms, right? From the smallest to the largest scale. Let's give you some concept about how big a chain would be, OK? In terms of in the real space phase. If you're dealing with polyethylene or polystyrene, if it's around this molecular way, the size scale is very similar. Okay, so a, a polymer chain in the fully extended form usually runs about hundreds of nanometer to several microns, a typical range. But you know the lens depends on molecular weight, etc. But that gives you some ballpark how big they would be. Um, if I say 5 micron, how does that ring a bell? How, how big is um, 1 micron size? Yeah, great, 10 to the minus 6 meters. So put it into perspective. How thick is a human here? If you 3 micron? Do I have other answers? 30, 40 microns. Actually, it's a great science project. <laughs> Why don't everybody take a hair off and measure by SCN? I bet everybody's hair is different. Some of them is thinner and wider, but usually it runs about 50 microns to a few hundreds microns, OK? You know, one millimeter, everybody gets the idea how big, because you can see the ruler, but hundreds of microns is 10 times smaller. That's human hair. And a fully extended chain, a few microns, if you need to cut hair by a few hundred times, very tiny. And mo most of the characterization techniques, microns can still be characterized by optical microscope. So if you take a chain is fully extended, in theory, if you have a fancy optical microscope, not even any electron microscope, you should be able to characterize it and study it. But once it's in the fully compact field, 5 nanometer is touching another region. It's about 500, five times, 500 times smaller, right? And most optical techniques just cannot see it. Optical has a limitation about 400 nanometer. Anything smaller, you need a very specialized tool to see very tiny features. OK, 5 nanometer, you need electron microscope to check it out. 
let's pretty much say in the early days, very hard to study polymer physics because not everything is going to be fully extended. I cannot use a microscope to look at my plastics and see how the chains behave. Right? It will be very much challenging. And so that's why in the early days, you will learn all the polymer physics. Try to think about most the simple form, most the simplistic form of a polymer chain, how they would be configured in three dimensionally, and how you can use some of the parameters to describe me. For example, I in the chain and how I adopt in terms of space wise. So, everybody, we learned about the smallest scale for a polyethylene chain, 5 nanometer. We learned it can adopt longest form is about 2.5 micron. But those two are the extremes, <laughs> right? You get extremely small case. which is very much a uh, condensed form. Everything is packed or almost as dense as possible. And you got a fully extended form. For example, I'm still going to use, this is about 5 nanometer. This is about, if it's fully extended, let's put it 3 microns, OK? We're not that extreme in this class, so we actually going to deal everything in the middle. So we're going to understand what's going on here for the rest of class. When it's not fully stretched, because that's extreme, not all the polymer we deal with in real life is going to be fully extracted. None of the engineering plastics you touch is going to be fully stretched. Neither of them will be fully compact. So what's left in the middle is most interesting to polymer physicists. And what that's where we study is where on the order of tens or hundreds now I mean to how the chain confirms in three dimensionally. Okay, so sort of like this, as a random chain occupying a three dimensional face. Okay. Question in the back? Yeah. When, when do people realize? Yes, the has That's an qu interesting question. I've never been asked this one. I think when, when you talk about polymer flexibility, it's actually, you would expect that just from a chemistry point of view, how the bond of your chain is. Because the chemical bond is not straight. If you think about the case I talk about here, the chain actually has an angle, and I'm just going to, start to talk about chain conformation after we talk about size. In, in conformation wise, you're always not going to have a straight chain. It's always going to be flexible, right? Because there's a bond angle and rotation built into it. You have flexibility. That's one of the beauty of the polymer is you have chain twisting and chain changing the angle. OK? So I'm going to take a quick Break. Anybody has question about dimension or size? Before we talk about the next topic, size and dimension for a polymer chain. Everybody got the, some ideas how they would behave in real space in terms of size? Okay, everybody gets it? Easy, huh? So think about this, Professor Gu. How can you describe me in terms of size? And I think somebody already told, talked about it's called end-to-end -end distance, right? So we're going to study this end-to-end -end distance for the rest of class. And how do, you, how do we use end-to-end -end distance to describe this chain? OK? End-to-end -end distance is one parameter. And we will also talk about radius of gyration, a second topic. If you open the textbook, 
We will first talk about end-to-end -end distance, the 6.2 chapter. And we will later talk about um, radius of gyration in the much later part. They both are able to describe how big your chain is. And they are actually intercorrelated. If you know one, you can predict the other. OK? So if nobody has a question about the size, then we're going to talk about the second part is conformation of the chain. So when I speak about conformation, what comes into your mind in terms of conformation? Uh, can you speak up a bit? Fisher projections. Fisher projections. Wow, that's a very very technical term, but you are right. Fisher projections. Everybody, everybody know what the Fisher projection is? Okay, good. We we're gonna talk about that. What is uh, Fisher projections? So, if I am again zooming very largely, let's put a hundred x into this particular polymer chain. What I'm going to see? What I'm going to see? Maybe 100. It's just a random number. 100. Uh, a thousand. 100. A few times. You're going to see the bond, right? You're going to see the carbon bond, the hydrogen bond, and you're going to have another polymer segment, right? You're going to have another hydrogen bond here. This is just the polymer backbone. So you're going to keep extending. But in this particular segment, that's what you're going to see. Is everything symmetric? No, right? Because you have carbon hydrogen. Those are the same. They are symmetric for this particular carbon. But this piece and this angle is not. So what the Fisher projection tells us is now, imagine you actually look along the backbone of this carbon-carbon bond, and you're going to see A, B, C. The other three bonds, because you're looking down in one of the bond direction, right? You're going to see A, B, C, three different bonds. OK? If I kind of draw it. Again, this is a me <laughs> looking down this direction. I'm going to see two of the hydrogen to the bottom. This would be a carbon in the center, right? And you have a long polymer chain going in that direction. Does that make sense to you? Everybody got it? OK. Then I'm going to look back. What's on the top? I'm going to see another plane, right? There's another carbon along this direction. And we have another polymer bond and two of the carbon hydrogen bond. So in other words, if I wrote something along here, where this can be the case where I have the hydrogen, hydrogen, bonds. OK? So because if you look it up, this is on my right hand. There's two on the top. Now you have two planes. Is the energy going to be equal? Because when I rotate the different plane, are they going to be the same? So in other words, this carbon-carbon bond is rotatable. Right? It's freely rotated in this direction. So when you start to think about chain conformation, in other words, chain conformation discusses about how different rotation changes the energy. And we're going to make a little bit more definition in that regards. So if you look at the, the handout where I give, 
This is a better way than I could draw on the board. Three-dimensionally, this is on the page four of the handout, okay? Three-dimensionally, this will be the one with the carbon, this will be the other one. We're gonna define a few terms. Okay, so this would be one with the carbon, another carbon, another carbon. You're gonna have one. So as we know, all the carbon-carbon bond can be rotated. So if you think about a Lego, it's connected by a rod, which can rotate in different directions, right? This is allowed it, but you cannot bend carbon-carbon bond, which is not typical. But rotation is very common. We already talked about, we can define, this is a bond angle, which defines what the angle is. And we know it's about 109 degree for a CH4 configuration. For carbon, it's more or less fixed around that range. You will have a little bit change depending on bulkiness of the side chains, but usually the same, okay? Hydrogen or oxygen will be different because they're gonna be having different bonds. But for the carbon, it's very common about that. That's your bond angle here. Now, if you consider these two as a whole, if you fix it, now, when you rotate this bond, you're gonna see different behavior, right? There is cases when they're totally opposite, we call it transform, right? The other possibility, if I would like to draw three-dimensionally, this is where this carbon can rotate inside and outside the, the blackboard, right? And we can actually define an angle of this called the dihedral angle, okay? Dihedral angle is basically tell you what's angle inside it. We can define it as, you know, any starting point. But for the simplicity of discussion here, we can define the dihedral angle. Wait a second, make sure I got it along right. Zero is opposite direction. So, in other words, if your bond is at opposite di direction, we can define this dihedral angle as zero. And now if you rotate 90 degree, Everybody gets it? The dihedral angle will be at the angle with respect to the bottom one. I can slow it down, make sure everybody understands what this rotation and dihedral angle means. Everybody gets it? Or a little bit too abstract? Yeah. Where, um, like for example, if you have two parallel lines here and then one going here, this angle and this angle are gonna be the same. Is that what you mean by saying dihedral angle? No, um, let me actually make a real example. So now I have, let me change the color so we can talk about color as well. So we now have a white, right? We have a green, we have blue. So if this is a bond of this carbon-carbon angle, we can have a second one going up and down, right? Everybody gets it. This angle is fixed because there's going to two more bonds going out the direction. Every carbon has four bonds going out. So same for the top. The other is attached to hydrogen, so we kind of omitted the other two. We only fi focus on the important things is carbon and look at the top and bottom. What I mean is, this bond is rotatable. So if I rotate around the top, as long as I fix 170 degree, uh, 109 degree, I can basically go in around this angle, this motion, right? So dihedral angle means what's the angle from, from the projection down to this plane. 
Okay, so on long look at the desk, I can rotate on the top to form a circle. If the, this is pointing 180 degree compared to the bottom of the bar, we define it as zero. Then you can rotate it as 90, as 120, as 180. Okay, so why does it matter? Because I believe somebody talked about theory hindrance. Now we're gonna, it will play a role here. Why? Because if your carbon-carbon bond is at a perfect zero degree dihedral angle or opposite into each other, you will have lower source of energy for the whole system. Because it's not uh, overlapping each other. If your dihedral angle is rotate 180, then you're going to have a lot of stirring hindrance, although it's like an abstract form, which not much occupy in, in, in my hands, but they're going to feel each other, and they don't like each other. They're not that homey. They don't like each other. OK? So the other way is somebody talked about Fisher form. This is another way you can think about. You can draw on plane, right? This is one of the rotating disk with one of the bulky group on the top. Mm -hmm. With one of the bulky group, let's make it a bulky. Now, the other plane is here. You have a bulky group. So when two of the bulky group are 90 degrees to each other, we call it a transform. Because when the top is rotatable, you could overlap with each other and start to create a sturdy hindrance. And a very famous plot people typically do is talk about energy of rotation at different chain conformation. Question? What is 90 and 180? It, it overlaps, is it 90 or is it 180? Which part of the you said 180. Yeah, you said the trans was 90. Oh, my bad. 180. Thanks for picking up. 180, okay? So, so think about if they're totally 180 degree opposite to each other, you would have lowest of the energy, right? Whenever you rotate the chain in a plane, you start to feel more stirring hindrance. And it's kind of symmetric, even you rotate left or right. Right? So we're going to have a lowest of the energy. Let's just uh, call it assistant energy. You would have a lowest of here. What if we start to hit an empty area here, right? If you can feel a void somewhere in between, Right? It will be eclipsed because you have some free volume there. Or it's right stuck in this 120 angle. So this would be 60, would be one of the minimum, right? Everybody see what's, what do I mean by saying that? Some of the not, some of the don't. I need to explain one more time. So. I'm going to play with every tool I can find. <laughs> Let's say this is the most bulky group in your, in, your, in your chain, which is carbon. This is the most bulky group. In the other direction, we have two carbon and one more. So when we rotate this carbon-carbon bond, top, this is carbon-hydrogen. You might be a little bit hard to see. Let me show this to you. So if this is a three of the bond, this is a polymer carbon backbone. This is carbon hydrogen anton. This is not carbon hydrogen. So which mimics this plane? Everybody got it? And this angle is always fixed there at 120. 
if you look at projection form. Sony? Um, so, I'm sorry, are you saying that the 120 degree angle is between the carbon and the backbone chain? No, wow. I um, I'm saying that that is a projection of your three-dimensional feature in a one-dimensional plane. So, so the hydrogen for 120 uh, to the backbone. Right. Okay. Right. Awesome. So now, because it's a polymer, you're going to have a second plane. I'm going to practice <laughs> a bit because I never done this before. There is a carbon-carbon bond in between. So now it, when I start to rotate, so look at what the change in terms of stirring hindrance. If they're totally overlapping with each other, that's good 180 degree because the dihedral angle, this is the highest of the energy, right? If, if you rotate this way, this is most happy because two of the bulky ones are totally opposite to each other. 180. But now when we turn, you will see um, some sort of maximum at 60 degrees because now carbon hydrogen and carbon carbon bond can be occupied in the same space. But there would be one minimum sort of around here. That's 120 degree, right? So this is 0, 60, 120, 180. So you would experience another local minima. I mean, they're not exactly overlapping with each other, but they would have raised the energy of the full the for the whole system, OK? So I'm going to start to fill in some of the area. And let's plot the bottom as dihedral angle. When does the system have the lowest energy state? Everybody got there? Zero, right? Because we kind of, th that's the angle when we define it as totally opposite. So, and how about here? 180. And it's pretty much symmetric. If you go minus 180, it will be, again, highest standard. How about here? A small energy minimum? 120, right? That's how, you know, for a given chain, then if you think about the um, polyethylene case, the chain actually would prefer to adopt three cases. Either the chain like to sit here, or here, or here, right? Because if you throw a ball in high energy state, it wants to relax to the low energy state. It's either going to stuck in this local minima or this is going to be the global minima for the system. And this we actually define the trends. So when the chain is totally opposite direction, right? That will be the lowest energy. And this will be, we call it Gauch plus and Gauch minus. And in, in three dimensionally, what specifically means is this is adopting a different angle, OK? So either stay here or here. We only talk about one of the bond. We can adopt three conformation, right? Let's just uh, look at one carbon bond, you know, carbon-carbon. You can actually have the top either adopt zero degree, which is trans, or this carbon can go here, 120. We call it plus or stay here. Now you think on the top of another bond, then this guy, another carbon, can adopt the same rotation around here. And it will have three options as well. Now since it's going to start getting a little bit crazy. We talk about how many carbon-carbon bonds in your polymer backbone, right? The total number is 20,000 for the given molecular weight. Somewhere, it's here, okay? You have 27K carbon-carbon bond, right? 
So each one will have three configuration. Now what's the possibility of you know the chain could take in terms of three dimensionally? It's it's very easy, right? So the possibility, because each one has three, you just need to multiply by how many bonds you have. So three power of twenty thousand. Well, probably some of you don't have any concept how big it is, but if we do some simplification, if you take a three square, that's about ten to the power of ten thousand times. Okay, this is the total configuration you could adopt for this chain. That means each bond angle it can rotate, right? Whenever it's rotate, if you have a camera fast enough, you can take a picture of it. With next to the second, you take another phone, you take a picture of it. It could totally occupy 10 to the power of 10,000. And if you can count one configuration per second, the total time will be longer than the universe. So it's impossible to get all the configuration. So in other words, the class is not designed to take a picture me of whenever I'm taking stop motion, let's say, understand when I take this configuration and understand what I'm doing here, or this configuration, or this angle. It's trying to understand on average. So if you take um, a million picture of me, whenever I teach, so you know on average, this part of body is pretty much stationary, right? Whenever I change, that's what the system is trying to understand is What's the average information you can get out of it? Okay, so the rest of the class will actually go into two different ways to understand. We want to forget about all the details of different atoms, hydrogen, carbons. When you change a polyethylene, you can have a polystyrene. Then what do we describe? We'll need a modification, right? Because polystyrene, polyethylene is not going to be having the same bond angle. It will be more bulky and hard to you know, describe using the same front. But what the essence we are trying to do is to capture what's a common thing for all the polymer. So in that regards, we're going to take some many unrealistic simplifications which don't exist in real world. Don't say why people would do that. You know, it's not going to be able to describe real face. But bear with me. The more you learn, you will realize those simple forms can be very powerful to describe your polymer chains conformation. OK? So that's why we're going to start with most ideal case. So if you want to simplify a polymer chain, what would you do? And we're going to take another short break, just a f five minutes break before we jump into that. So for now, we talked about two things, size and conformation. OK, everybody gets what, the, what are these two? So let's take a two, three minutes bathroom break, then come back. We're going to talk about how can we simplify polymer chains model to make it universal and can describe all the polymer chain at once. In other words, I can describe polystyrene, I can describe polyethylene, I can describe P3HT or any given polymer you can think about. OK? All right? Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. I'm curious about this summit. Why uh, this mm -hmm. goal, uh, it, it's reasonable to go uh, increase, but why it would decrease? Pass? Yeah, yeah, that's very easy to understand. So uh -huh. if you think about this is one plane, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. And this is the other one. You just uh, put it on top of here and start rotate. Yeah. So when it's overlaps with carbon hydrogen bar, it start to experience oh, so the hydrogen. When the one leaves, yeah. start to decrease. 
increase. Yeah, so this would be 0, 60, 120, and 180, right? This would be where it's experiencing a local minima. But this does not overlay directly on the... Oh, I got it. Yeah? So here we have the angle for here. Mm -hmm. No interaction, so at uh, 0. So yeah. the energy is low. And so if we make at 180, it should be higher or it should be the same? No, it will be highest because now your your most bulky group sits on the top of each other. Yeah, so... Yeah, you yeah. 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 So That's right here. They need to get the yeah. few so more trucks. I remember, yeah, we mm -hmm. do it like this in the carbon. And we have three pumps. Yeah. And this is other carbon. Yeah. Like yeah. Yes. Hydrogen yeah. and hydrogen and other carbon. Yeah. Like this. this so... This will be S, yeah. This yeah. will be ethylene, but you system. wouldn't have these, right? Yeah. So it's you have always like a chain. gonna like a chain and yeah. Chain. Right. Yeah. So if I make like for 19, for example. Yeah. Okay. So it would be the same. This would be the same. Yes. So this one. And this here. now you need to turn 90. Like this. Like yes. This. It would be like this. But here this one. No, no, no. no. This is the. 180, 90, you're only going to be rich here. This is for 90, yeah? This is for 90. So, are you fixing this? Where is the carbon? Yeah, Draw so the carbon carbon bond so now. Chain, okay, for example, the chain for example, will be here. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the chain. And here, the chain will be here, for example. Okay. No, you should have fixed it, because <laughs> it's only rotate. Let's fix this one. So okay. let's assume this is okay. fixed, and you turn this 90, we'll reach here, right? Okay. Right. If you turn this way 90 or that way 90, okay. because the other other carbon carbon, you should yes. fix it. Yeah. Then yeah, where so you see. So that's why it would be high. Yeah. No, this is the 180, yeah, right? If you turn it 180, it will sit on the top of each other. Yes. That's why. You, yeah. We're together. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, so let's continue to talk about 10, 20 minutes. So now, let's say I don't want to deal with any polymer anymore. I just want as simple as possible. What can we take away from our polymer chain? And and came up a simple idea that would describe our polymer, and later we can make it as complex as, as we want, but we just need as very simple for now. What kind of chain model we can do, and how would you do it? Free moving chain. Free moving chain. Can you describe a little bit? What do you mean by free moving chain? It can fold back on itself, so it can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I hear you can remove the restriction about this 109 degree and make it arbitrary. Arbitrary in three dimensionally. Not just in this way. You know, you can, you can go from zero degree to 180, but also rotate in and out the blackboard plane. Right? So we actually have a good way to describe and give it a name. We call it free jointed chain. And this model is great for describing ideal chain. And I'll explain why that's the case. Because it's removed all the restrictions you would have in real chain. Your chain is no longer need to worry about the angle it needs to be fixed at. 
So I don't need to worry about my carbon, carbon bond. It helps to be 109 degree. I can be anything I want to be. And it will give you a lot of benefit in terms of mathematically later on because you will see if you don't have restrictions, there's a lot of shortcuts you can take to understand how they would confirm three-dimensionally. Second is it allowed chains to sit on the top of each other. You know, in the real world, you know, it would never happen that I can occupy the same space with you. You probably already punched me and said, get it, you know, don't get too close, right? But in ideal chain case, you can. You can actually occupy the same space several times. And it will give you the ability to understand why you can fold the chain back and the photo chain forward, and they would have equal chance. If you think about free joint chain, the probability in a three-dimensional space, every possibility is the same. OK? So this would be the easiest, it is the most uh, simple case. So we're going to talk about this particular model in next class. So we wouldn't touch it for now. OK? So what we're going to do in the next 10 to 20 minutes is to actually review a few basic concepts in terms of mathematics, in terms of vector and scalar. And this actually will give me the benefit of understand, uh, for you guys to understand the next class in terms of different chain model. OK? So. I handed out this for you, and hopefully you had a little bit of time to take a read. Everybody had a chance? But those are just a very basic fundamental concepts of um, vectors, etc. So um, where we should start? So if, uh, can I have a, just a roughly a head count? Is everybody very familiar with concept vector and uh, scalar? I see almost everybody, right? I mean, see, okay, that makes my life easy. I can cut it down to five minutes <laughs> as, a sh as a recap for everybody. So what is a scalar and a vector? So I like to give a describers about one only cares about magnitude. The other concept has a direction as well as magnitude. So think about, last year I gave example like, go to New Orleans. Everybody knows about one hour, 40 minutes drive. If you can drive in one, 30 minutes, you can talk to another professor. He claimed he can drive one hour, 20 minutes, which I wouldn't risk that. <laughs> but it's give you relative dimension, right? And you need to know, this is about 120 miles, and it's in a given direction. If you drive 120 miles, which is only talk about distance, if you drive to the east, you wouldn't get there. If you go to southeast, you can go to Mobile, Alabama, instead of there, right? So vector has two components. So this will be a short review. I like this class much better. Last year when I asked how many of you can learn this, three out of 12. So, vector is usually described as this. It has distance and a direction. So if you, we think about three dim, uh, two dimensional scale, if we think about this is x and this y, we can describe how any of the, you know, the, the points on our scale as a direction from 0, which is the origin, to this place, right? So a point of 2, 3 
means you're going to take two steps in the x direction, three steps in the y direction. And that would give you this vector in two-dimensional axis. Correct? Everybody gets that? Very easy, right? So what's the beauty of the vector is actually you can di directly use the vector to give you directions. Let's say I'm going to use again the same example I gave last year where it's about going to Houston. So you need to go to New Orleans about 120 miles. Then you're going to take a right turn all the way to the west. And that's about another maybe four or five hour drive. So that's about 300 mile plus somewhere around there. So you're going to take, let's give you an example. This is the Hattiesburg. OK. So New Orleans is roughly there. So this would be one of the vector, right? Then this would be second vector. This would be A. This would be B. So if I go and I'm telling you I'm going to take you all the way to New Orleans, then you know if I want to reach there, C, vector going to be equals to A plus B. Because it has directions. So A plus B going to be equals to C, right? But the vectors has a unique property to it. Um, you can directly add a variety of vectors. So it will give you a new vector that's a sum of the previous two, right? It, was, it will also have a different property, because now the, the vector, this is new vector c. If I need to know the magnitude of c, it's not direct a plus b, right? It will be quite different in terms of So this symbol, t slash on left and high, on left and right is called absolute. It will take away any s directionality in your vector and give out what the magnitude of your vector is. Okay, so if I need to do this, we know you would have different. Let me make sure that my mass is still good. Actually. I don't think it's in this particular one, but I'm trying to remember that. That should be B. No, that should be A. What about B? by, this is theta, so well, by by sine theta. If I'm wrong, I'm going to crack the next class. OK? So that's how you get the magnitude. So in our class, what matters for us most is, if you think about end-to-end -end distance of a polymer chain, now you have an easier way to understand you, what happens to a polymer chain, right? For a given polymer chain, Again, I'm going to draw a random coil, sort of semi-random. And if you zoom in, each of the area is going to be a carbon atom sitting here, right? And it's going in a three-dimensional way. But if we know what is this carbon-carbon bond is pointing at, we can define as a vector A, and this defined as vector B. then the end-to-end -end distance will be very easy to get. All you need to do is just add A, B, C, D, E, F, G until whatever, how many repeating units. So mathematically, you can use a sum function to describe, add everything together, right? So let's define as, instead of A, we define as L, I. I is just a number assigned to particular bond. So